One, two, three. Now we've counted down. We've got green lights. We're blast off. This is our last day of discussion before we have our examination. Next Tuesday, I will show up. I will have three essay questions asking you to write on two. Twelve and probably an extra credit item asking you to write on ten. Something like that should sound terribly familiar to you by now, but then it sounds more familiar to me because I've been thinking about it, and some of you have actually forgot the exam format from last time, etc. But that's also one reason why I like to give you the exam format back so that you have sort of that as a way to remember what we do in here. What was the extra credit? Now that we're on the tape, you say, I hate to do that. We'll do that later, or somebody near you can whisper it to you, or I will whisper it to you, okay? Well, wait, I don't know. Let's, let's work on the assumption that if we really want to keep this a secret among the chosen few in here, that we have to do that in a strategic way. But I'm not willing to exclude you. It's just that I don't want to include people that are vultures. It's the vultures that I try to work against, right? Anyway, uh, we're nearing, narrowing, or nearing the end of our list of theories. By now, some of you are suffering the theory counterpart of sticker shock. Way too many theories. I've tried to enumerate them, which is maybe good and bad, but simply as a way of flagging the differences that exist. And if we can get our PowerPoint screen up, which we do, thank you we can look at this one. Uh, what we're going to talk about from, for the rest of the time on this exam and the rest of today is the assumption that in interpersonal communication, uh, it is strategic. That doesn't surprise anyone. Uh, there are a variety of theories that explain the strategies that we use, how it goes about, or how we go about doing that which we think can have a positive effect upon a relationship and or a negative effect upon a relationship, depending upon, in a sense, what our goals are. But the assumption that, or the premise that captures the essence of planning theory is that people create and enact plans to seek positive or avoid negative relationships. And that's very typical of where we've come to be up to this point, isn't it? Let's look at two related areas of analysis. One of these is the notion of persuasion theory. I mentioned when we talked about persuasion theory that there are people, most particularly a fellow by the name of Steve Duck, who argues that we try to persuade other people to like us. We like to persuade other people to see us as being their friend. Does that make sense? Which means then that I try to demonstrate to you that I bring positives to your life rather than I create negatives. Because you see, remember, back when we talked about persuasion, that however we break persuasion theory down, it eventually comes to a point of asking the question, why as individuals do we seek to know how to acquire positive outcomes and avoid negative outcomes? And the same thing is true here, isn't it? Isn't a friendship a positive outcome? And isn't an enemyship a negative outcome, if you would? Who are the people that are not worth being in a relationship with? Being friends, etc., etc. And as I've said before, some of these are our relatives. We don't necessarily like people just because we're somehow genetically or legally connected to them. Those are merely matters of chance, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily have to like everybody, etc., etc. So, one of the assumptions that we make in planning theory is that there are ways that we learn, rules that we follow, if you will, we'll get to that point in just a moment, that help us to know how to prove ourselves as a worthy friend, prove ourselves as a worthy relative, if you would, prove ourselves as a worthy employee, superior subordinate questions, boss and employee questions, prove ourselves as a whatever it might be. This morning, for instance, at breakfast in my little motel down there, ran onto a guy kind of interesting. 
And before long, we found out that we had some similar uh, philosophical uh, uh, positions, uh, similar political positions. Uh, he said that he had done some things. He'd been born and raised in northern Arkansas. Said, my wife's from Arkansas, da 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 well, found out we had a lot in common. He said, and at one point in my life, I hauled apples from Gunnison, I mean from Grand Junction, Colorado, to Crowley, Louisiana. I said, Grand Junction, Colorado, I was born and raised just a few miles from there. Well, I look upon this as a pleasant moment of experience. I'll probably never see the guy again. But for a while, we were having a wonderful little relationship. And if I were to see him again, wouldn't I look forward to it? Wouldn't I say, hey, I, good to see you again. Glad you're, how you doing? Everything going okay? He's got two absolutely precious granddaughters. Sounds like a kind of thing I could talk about, doesn't it? I have two absolutely precious grandchildren. You see what I'm saying is, in a very short period of time, Without any specific purpose, we began to develop a purpose to demonstrate that it was a pleasant moment, and we chatted amiably, cordially, all kinds of things. Now, if we talk long enough, we could probably find where we disagree with one another, we could come to hate one another. But you see, it's an evolving sort of set of events, isn't it? But up to the point, we prove to each other that we can be friends. Now, how good a friend are we? Well, that's a hypothesis that we could test somewhere else. The next question that we talk about, and this kind of brings in that notion of friend, is back to the rules orientation. Aren't there rules of action? Aren't there rules of interpretation? Regulative rules? Constitutive rules? I know you tried really hard to forget that after the last examination, but that's a kind of way of thinking about this. Aren't there regulative rules that I need to know and to follow? that can indicate that I know how to be friendly or I know how to be unfriendly, whatever it might be. And conversely, don't I have ways of interpreting what are friendly comments as opposed to perhaps unfriendly? Well, you see what we do over life is we store all of this kind of stuff up. Now one of the things that's kind of interesting is that we get into some sorts of categories then of how we break this down and we analyze it. First of all, and this is a theme that we've talked about before, the cognitive skills that the individuals have that are communicating can have something to do with their, inter their interpretation and planning skills. Their interpretation and planning skills. Now, my birthday is on Monday next week, and so my grandson, four years old, has decided that I need a toy. In fact, I need a John Deere tractor, front-end loader, that is sold at the Mercantile Store in Round Top, Texas. Is that transparent, folks? Why does he think granddad needs a tractor because he figures that granddad will let his one perfect grandson play with one interesting John Deere front-end loader tractor, right? But you see what I'm getting at? There's a plan to this. Little Miss two-year-old is not as clever as Mr. Four-year-old, and good heaven's sakes, how clever they will become by the time they get to be 16. Oh, Lord. Oh, my gosh. You see what I'm getting at is that part of the maturation process is to acquire, practice, and become skilled in these sorts of things. Well, part of it is simply understanding it. If people have a lower IQ, is it likely that they have a lower array of communication skills? I don't know how many of you ever saw, or if you did, remember the movie Rain Man. Dustin Hoffman played the, the brother of uh, Tom Cruise, and Dustin Hoffman had at some point in his mental development stopped stop short of what we would say would be a normal development. We can refer to that in whatever politically correct way, but you know what I'm talking about, right? 
And he had a very limited repertoire of things that he did and things that he said and the ways in which he said those sorts of things. So you see, <coughs> that can become important. We also become interested later on in how people get these frames. Is it amazing to us, particularly we want to be in television, entertainment, programming, is it amazing that adolescents love programs about situational comedy or situational drama that deal with interpersonal relationships? I can't think of anything more important to the typical adolescent than how do you know what in the world is going on? What do you say? How do you say it? Now here I am as a geezer visiting with another geezer and we pretty well got geezer talk worked out. And I'm willing to believe that it is a lot more general and forgiving than the common conversation among adolescents in a high school on a given day. Because how well you know the popular talk can be very much predictive of whether you are accepted or not accepted, right? You see what I'm getting at? It's sometimes enormously fine-tuned. So we've got the cognitive interpretations and planning. We talk about things like sensitivity and, and monitoring, etc. Interaction skills. How good are we at interaction skills? Some of you have small children around. They're not terribly good, but they're wonderfully winning anyway, right? But they do that because of their innocence rather than because of their cleverness. Now what's also interesting is that as you get on the other end of the continuum in age, you can run into some problems because grandmother who used to be able to interact in a fairly skillful way now is sitting drooling and has lost her ability to interact in a fairly skillful way. And that can become really, really disorienting, dissatisfying to people because they remember grandmother when and now they have to deal. And we in communication deal with communicating with the aging as a very real part of the analysis of interpersonal communication because it's a phenomena. We also have to deal with individual grieving, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But how do we know the skills that are relevant to what is needed at the moment given the nature, the purpose of this particular interaction? And our motivation. How much does our motivation affect what we're going to do and what we call upon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Dating is heavily motivated behavior, would you say? Job seeking is heavily motivated behavior. We may work very hard to develop the skills, the rituals, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of those things. Um, there is then in planning theory something that comes under the heading of interaction logics. Interaction logics are, in this situation, this is how I ought to behave. And we put the word logic in there because it's sort of in that ballpark of how we friendly talk. And that is, well, it's a logical thing to say certain things, and it's an illogical thing to say other things. Anecdote time. Young husband wanting to be tuned into things that my wife's interested in. My wife reading a woman's magazine because these questions are never raised in a man's magazine. On a scale of one to five, rate me on or give me a grade four, right? Men never expect women to respond to them that way. Women must think that way because they have pieces in the magazines along those lines. There are people that actually study women's magazines to see how women focus on and deal with interaction challenges in their life. And the discovery is that women's magazines deal with that sort of thing and men's magazines don't, which is interesting, I think. Very revealing. We'll talk more about those sorts of things in mass media, right? Okay. Now, my mother, when it came to cleaning a house, was an A+, plus, unless there's a higher score. I never worried about any food dropping on the floor and not being able to just get down and lick it up if I want. Mother was a compulsive housekeeper. Here I am, married about a year, and my wife says, on a scale F to A, how do you rate me as a housekeeper? 
This is under the heading of Bozo. I gave her a C plus, which I suspect she's never forgotten and probably never forgiven. Interaction, right? The interaction logic, what not to say, what to say. Now, I'm one of those kind of people, and I know that sometimes students say I can't believe it. I'm one of those kind of people that if you are stuck with me at a party, about two seconds into the conversation, I have told you everything that I know. There is nothing on my mind. I can't think of a single thing to talk about. You know those kind of people? I shan't ask that any of you in here are those kinds of people. I lack a lot of interaction skills. Well, you say, well, we don't see that. You come, we come to your office, etc. So I'm the king of my office, aren't I? I control everything there. I'm the boss. I'm the guru. You play my game when you're in my office. I'm comfortable with that. You may not be, but then it's my office, right? But if it's just the two of us out in a social thing, in about two seconds, I may have talked to you everything that you want, particularly if you say, well, what's your favorite sitcom for people in a demographic 19 to 23. I don't know. I've watched one episode of Friends in my life, and the only reason was for you folks, right? But Friends is going to teach you about interaction skills and the logics, etc., etc., of that, and I'm into geezer talk, which I'm mastering very nicely. Expressive logics, expressive logics. Expressive logics are what can we say of a sort of what? Feeling or explosive nature. I was going home the other night listening to NPR radio and they were talking about anger management. I didn't realize that the American Psychological Association had no indicators for measuring anxiety, I mean measuring anger until sometime in the 80s. They had no protocols for dealing with it, and now there is an entire cottage industry in anger management out there. They even go so far as to have anger management training skills in juvenile and adult probation programs on the assumption that one of the reasons that some of these people got into trouble was they threw a fit at the wrong time, which may account for why some people are in jail and the rest of us are not. We threw a fit, but at the right time or certainly not at the wrong time, right? Uh, there have been times that I thought I was throwing a fit at the wrong time and my wife was kicking me at the same time. Expressive logics, I love you. If I just walk up to you on the street and approach you and say, I love you, is that, you see what I'm saying? Well, we did that in the 60s. We tried that for about <laughs> 10 days, right? You know. Well, how about if I walk up and say, I hate you. Has that ever happened? People come up to you and said things, and you say, my God, where did that come from? Right? What is the expressive logic? My grandchildren will tell me, you know, we don't love you. Doesn't bother me. Why? Because that's what children say. Do they mean that? Get me close to that mercantile store and that John Deere tractor, and my grandson will love me an enormous amount, at least for the length of time it takes to get granddad's credit card out. You see what I'm saying? And is that fickle? No, that's just children, isn't it? That's just the way they are. Adolescents screaming at you, I hate you. I used to say to my daughter, I love you. I hate you. I love you. I hate you. I love you. And finally she gets to laughing because she realized that no matter what she said, I simply wouldn't yield to the intimidation of her screaming at me. And I meant it. Absolutely, positively, never doubted it. But you see what I'm getting at? There is a logic to this. There is an appropriateness to this. There is a strategic opportunity. I saw the other night, for instance, something, and I didn't understand it completely, but police officers conspired with a guy who seemed to be arrested. In the middle of being arrested, he proposes to his girlfriend. That got to be way too complicated for me, right? But is that an expressive logic? Or how about at the Astrodome? You propose on camera, and all of a sudden she looks and she says, you're kidding, <laughs> right? Well, it was caught off guard. Those of us that are the Cupid fans 
when it came time for the couple to get married, and they said, this is us, private, we can have, you can have your million bucks back, we're going to get married, but not here. Now, I'm just dying to know whether they did. There's never been any news story on that that I've seen. Maybe I need to go on to the cupidwatcher.com website and find out what's going out there, right? Conventional logics. Conventional logics simply are those that we know that happen over and over and over and over again. You drive into your local Wendy's and you say, I'll take a filet medium rare, little Merlot, twice baked potatoes, conventional logic. That works maybe at Morton's, but at Wendy's. Wendy's wants your number. I'll take a number two, a number three, a number four. We have reduced food to a number, a conventional logic. What's interesting is, and sometimes when you go abroad, you notice this very, very dramatically because what is a conventional logic just to get through the day in our society may not be in another society. Yeah? You said things that happen over and over again. What things? Well, like buying a hamburger. Right, just stuff. You're absolutely right, just stuff. You know, we have, we have a, do you have a buying logic? You go up to somebody in a store and you know how to buy something, they know how to sell something, you know what that routine is, right? See, that's what I'm talking about, those kind of just conventional logics that just get us through the day. You come into my office, you want to get a review sheet, right? All of those things that we go through, you want to get some counseling from the academic advisor, what's the academic advisor conventional logic? You see what I'm getting at? We have hundreds of these things. We're building up to something, and that is that over time we develop a pretty substantial repertoire of these, but we also know that as life changes and we move along, some of these become used for the first time, don't they? We're going to talk about that in a theory called assembly effect theory. Rhetorical logics. These are the persuasive logics. If I want to persuade you, compliance gaining would be one of those logics, wouldn't it? How do I persuade you to do something if you are my friend? Is that different than if you're just a passing acquaintance? I had a battery go dead. Fellow offered to jump my battery. I had jumper cables. And my wife said, you should have offered him money. Should I? I don't know. Shouldn't he have said for 10 bucks? Is this friendship or is this commerce? You see, there's an ambiguity in those interactions. I dealt with it as a friendship. My wife thought it was a commercial transaction. I don't know. Didn't offer him any money. I would have jumped his car if he needed it. I wouldn't have expected money. But you see how we can sometimes miscommunicate because we're operating out of different logics. But a rhetorical logic or a persuasive logic is where I set out to persuade you explicitly to some end, and there are logics by which you do that. And they differ if you are two years old or if you're four years old, or if you are whatever. Message goal structure, we're now into what we kind of talked about before in one of the theories of, of interaction, and that is that over time I have to go through a set of message events to get where I'm going. Right? I get where I'm going. We talked the other day about trial intimacy moves. If I want to test how good a friendship we are, or how good of a romance ship we are, or whatever it might be, are there ways of doing that? Do children spend part of their day testing how much their parents love them? I would say yes. I really would. I think that children need a lot of expression of love and affection. Because I think that one of the great issues of children is to what extent can I just really be an innocent, loved child? One of the reasons that I say that is, that I feel so bad for children who do not enjoy that age of innocence, where they can just be a child. You know what I'm saying? They're in a war zone or they're in you know, absolute terrible poverty or they're living out of a car with their parents or something like that. Sometimes in our talk, there is a task bias. Some people say men are into report talk there is a socio-emotional bias. Sometimes there is a rapport talk bias. You see what I'm getting at? My wife and I were conversing last night, cell phones, 
we're talking about something. I can't remember what it was. And I'm saying, my God, the detail of this woman getting to wherever it is that she's going here. Let's just get to it. And I'm reminded that happens. It's a gender issue often, isn't it? But it also can be a situational issue. If I'm explaining something that I like very much, doesn't my wife say, well, just tell me you like it and get over with it, right? Meaning that sometimes we can include too much or too little of one or the other of these sorts of dimensions. Well, okay, we talked about action assembly theory. We communicate in routine and novel ways. We learn and develop routine actions and are variously able to know and enact novel interaction rituals. What in the world does that mean? One of my examples. Story time. I get back as a college student from a debate trip. I'm in my apartment, sort of cleaning up, doing whatever's necessary as a college student. I just got back from a debate trip, and the the, uh, the person that ran the debate, the faculty member, the faculty advisor of the debate team, shows up at my door. Knock, 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 knock. That's unusual. He doesn't usually do that. And he said, you need to call your sister. Oh, boy, now this is interesting, isn't it? That's out of the routine. You need to call your sister. My sister lived in the town where I went to college. And so I get on the phone. I call my sister and find out that my dad died. Our dad. Her dad, my dad died. I'm 19, 20, I forget. Something like that. Now, some of you have experienced this, and I talk about it not to make you feel bad or anything like this, but some of it you may say, yeah, that was sort of what I felt. So, I've never had a parent die before. Am I unprepared for that? Well, only unprepared for that. I'm unprepared for going to a funeral where people are talking about your parent. I knew your dad well. He was a fine man. He was a terrible man. He was a this, he was a that, and all this, you know. When my mother died many years later, did I react in much different ways? Because, see, I'd been through more of these events. I actually was in a very cheery mood because she had had a long period of bad health, and the notion was that, and this may sound terribly cruel, but that at least that suffering was now ended, and we honored her life and her hope and the richness of the experience because that's what her life meant to us. You see what I'm getting at? And so there, even in that situation, there is a logic to how you respond. But you do that differently if you've had some practice. You see, that's the difference between the novel and the not-so-novel. You talk about people who, after some period of time of marriage, either lose their spouse to bad health, death, or to a divorce, and now they have to begin to debate. debate. They begin to date again. Huh. What are the dating rituals? I haven't thought about that since I was 19. Here I am, 53. My wife's parents got divorced after something like 45 years. Grandmother didn't want anything to do with any man under any circumstance ever again. But the husband went through this dating ritual, and it was traumatic to the children. And it often is, right? He's well up in his 70s. And he meets a woman that he knew, romantically engaged. They date. They marry. And are married now for 15 years, and he dies at age 91. Most of us don't go into that, quote, adolescent period at age 86. I mean, 76, right? See what I'm getting at? So, well, then, why do teenagers consume a lot of stuff about interaction rituals? Is because they're learning. Okay, we learn. Remember the social learning theory? We talked about that before. How do we learn according to social learning theory, which is a persuasion theory? Part of it is we learn from direct experience. I engage in a conversation. To, how, to what extent does how you communicate depend upon how people have communicated with you in what is often a fairly routine kind of way, right? 
your parents talk to you. I have a class with a student that is very, very silent. And I said to him one day, you and your parents don't talk very much, do you? No. Okay. Now, what if your family situation is one of happiness and conversation and joy and all of this? Do you learn those interaction rituals differently than if your family is one of great turmoil and screaming and shouting and going on? And then we build in cultural things, don't we? Western Colorado, a lot of Italians moved in to mine coal. One of my good friends had Italian first generation, I mean, one of them was first generation, the other one was from Italy. They'd been married for a thousand years. And to listen to them in an evening would lead you to believe this is the last day the marriage will ever survive. Screaming, shouting, gesturing, going on, going on, and then, well, okay, that's over. We go on about the rest of our evening. I'm in the midst of this. I say to Frank, they've been this way forever? He said, they're Italian. You see what I'm getting at is that we learn this stuff, direct experience. People sometimes tell us things. Children's conversation has a lot to do with telling us how to talk to one another, etc., etc. Okay, role playing. How much of the interaction rituals of life do we learn through role playing? Children's life is role-playing conversation, isn't it? Children talking to dolls, children talking to toys, children da 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 Play is work for children. They're learning a lot about how to interact. Finally, modeling. To what extent do we learn how to react if we look at how other people react? Is it any reason why people who were raised in a family of fighters turn out to be fighters? My wife was raised in a polite southern family where there was very little of any conversation at the dinner table. I was raised in a highly political family where we would argue over absolutely everything and my uncle, who was one of the dearest human beings in the world, would use words which you're not supposed to use in polite conversation. I can't even use them on tape. So you know now what those words are. Because you learned somewhere along the line with your parents saying, don't say that in front of grandmother. It's those kinds of words, you see. And I looked across the table at my poor wife, who first of all is amazed that people are talking at the dinner table, and secondly, Grand Uncle Lorne is using those words? Well, he's the dearest man in the world to me. I was actually, this is a true story, highly disclosed to the hello television world, I actually was fonder of my uncle, but this often happens in families too, doesn't it? Because you have to have such a rivalry with your dad. I was actually fonder of my uncle than I was of my dad. So anything that he did seemed to me to be pretty much okay. Well, okay, how does this all play out? One time we three boys, my two cousins and I, are talking and we use manly language which is not necessarily a problem except grandmother is standing there. So either our, my dad or my uncle scolded us, don't say that. Grandmothers. Grandmothers are the most wonderful beings in the world. Well, maybe except for granddads. Grandmother said, where do you think those boys learned that? She was there to defend her boys. That's why we loved grandmother. If we used that kind of language, it was because we imitated our dads. Modeling, right? Where do we learn those kinds of words? Well, we've already realized that little Mr. Four-year-old never misses a word, and the more that word is a t taboo word, the more somehow intuitively it seems to be just right to learn. You know what I'm saying? What is it? Is it our tone of voice? You use one of those taboo words and you just absolutely guarantee yourself that Mr. Big Shot out there is going to use that just about as soon as he can. And he's going to experiment with it to see if he uses it in the right way. Well, you see, what I'm getting at is that we develop over time a rather substantial repertoire. And then when we engage in communication planning, we draw upon that repertoire of repeated interactions.
of repeated interactions. We've done this before, we've talked about this before, we've said this before, etc., etc. So we communicate in routine and novel ways. We learn and develop routine actions over time by communicating in very ritualistic, normative ways over time and are variously able to know and enact novel interaction rituals. And the novel and the interaction rituals are sort of those life-turning rituals. Standing up in front of a group of people and swearing to love one another forever, that can happen once in a lifetime, doesn't it? And the irony of it is, almost every time people get married, somebody says, no matter what you say, it's going to be official regardless. So don't worry about it if you stumble over words and so forth. Well, okay. We then sort of assume under action assembly theory that life breaks into roughly two categories, that which is routine and that which is novel, right? Novel simply means I've never said these sorts of things before. I've never been in this situation before. You know what's interesting? Here I am at my age, and in my entire life, I've never been fired. Now, some of you might say, well, you sure should have been. But I've never been fired. I've, in consulting, not been hired again, which may be a kind of firing, but nobody ever looked at me and said, you're history. Nobody ever did. See what I'm getting at? Wouldn't that be novel if when I get back to my office they are all there ready to fire me? You see what I'm getting at? I don't think I'm really prepared for it. How would I react? Well, one of the reasons that people react in, quote, unsocial or antisocial ways is that sometimes we react and it's the wrong logic. You see what I'm getting at? It is the wrong logic. To what extent, by the time we're X age, is a fair amount of what we say already a matter of learned logics, plans, and scripts? To what extent is your conversation, on a daily basis, heavily scripted? You want to carry a tape recorder with you ten days in a row and try to remember which of the ten days any conversation transpired because is it likely that each day they are very much the same? Scripted behavior coming to work in the morning. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you again. Fine. Thank you. What's your day like? Hey, what's going to be? We can play that out, right? I've said before, you tell me what members of the faculty of the School of Communication are going to be in a meeting, and I'll tell you the meeting. I don't have to go to it. We have played our interaction as faculty out so scripted now that you just tell me who is in the room, and I will tell you what the conversation is. I'll tell you what the meeting is like. Scripted communication. Is organizational behavior scripted? And sometimes we purposefully try to script it, right? If we are running a franchise, don't we want scripted? Ever gone in where they're trying to train the new person in a Wendy's? There's a Wendy's way, isn't there? Hi, welcome to Kmart. Welcome to Walmart. Get a basket. Fill it up. Make us wealthy. Right? All of these rituals. Life is very ritualistic, isn't it? Well, we have to learn all of that. And then what's more is that sometimes we have to use it in various ways that make us sound less ritualized. We assume that practice in the use of logics, plans, and scripts can somehow be valuable to us. We assume that people have varying degrees of adaptation, adaptiveness and flexibility. When we talked before, and I remember some of you liking the notion of easy interaction or synchronized communication. Are those the flexible communicators? They always seem to be able to say the right thing at the right time. You see what I'm getting at? Situational retrieval of logic plans and scripts, meaning that I got all of this stuff stored in my head, and then the question of bringing it back and making sense of it and using it. Back to talking about aging again. My wife and I have a very elderly aunt of hers, and one of the questions is, Hi, do you know who we are? It's a terrible thing to have to ask, but at least if you, she says, Yes, you're Mary Virginia, we know this is one of her good days. Wonderful scene at the end of that movie, Driving Miss Daisy. I think it's the greatest ending of a movie that I've ever seen in my life. I love the end of Driving Miss Daisy. 
Morgan Freeman shows up. He's an old geezer. She's an old geezerette. And he says, how you doing? And she says, as good as I can be. And that says a lot at that age, right? Da, 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 right? Someday Morgan will show up and she doesn't know who Morgan is. She can't even say, doing as good as I can be. Well, you see what I'm getting at here? This is, in a sense, the life experience and how intrinsic communication is in a noble patterned way to these interaction rituals. Well, it assumes all of these things that we talked about, logics, plans, scripts. Whoops, I've now poked the wrong thing. Oh. Do not leave me in a room with a machine, unattended, right? Assumes the ability to engage in conversation management. Assumes the ability to make appropriate utterances. Assumes the ability to engage in conversation regulation. We can sort of single that one out and talk a little bit about it, right? What do we mean by conversational regulation? Remember something we talked about called a demand ticket? If I say, hey, speaking about John Deere tractors, is it likely that I'm now going to play out some of the conversation with Mr. Big Shot? Speaking about tractors, Grandad, I wasn't, but I can. That's a demand ticket, right? Floor keeping. Floor keeping. Somebody is arguing and you say, don't interrupt me. I'm not done talking to you. Write that one down. It'll be useful for you when you have teenagers. You will remember it because you learned it from your mother, father, somewhere along the line, right? Look at me when you, yes, okay? Would a conversational regulation also be like, I can't remember the phrase for it, but like, you know if somebody asks you, how are you, and you say, I'm fine. Right. You know, just regular things you say. Phatic communication. The point being that if you ask me, how are you, you don't want me to tell you. Conversational regulation because it's in the because it might be response. you would then say that's more than I want or I don't have time I've got to sort socks or you know you, there are ways of ending conversations aren't there or you then say well now that I've listened to you you wouldn't believe all of the problems that I've got one of the problems that you get into as you talk about your health is that you may become obligated to listen to somebody else. Right? But there are lots of these conversational management things, right? Calm down. Tell me what's on your mind. Tell me who you are. How does that make you feel? Do you see, all of these are comments that are designed in one way or another to regulate communication, conversation. Some the ability to regulate physiological requirements, anger management, anger management. Why every time we talk about this do you get mad? Ever heard that? Every time we're talking about this, this makes me sad. Physiological elements. Don't you sit there smiling at me. This is a serious conversation. One of the problems that we get into in life is that sometimes we smile at serious moments. I've actually seen some research that tries to explain that. I don't know what it is. You ever had that dopey feeling? Why am I sitting here smiling? Yesterday, in a conversation, somebody was talking about the sort of strange event that led to a death in the family. person got hit over the head with a mandolin. Now, how many times have you ever heard of a story about somebody dying because they got hit over the head with a mandolin? That's the sort of thing you would see in a strange sitcom, wouldn't you? One guy in the conversation started laughing, and then he said, excuse me for laughing, but that's my reaction. Is that okay? Well, we'll see. But it's a physiological reaction which may violate the normative expectation or requirement. Assume the ability to coordinate elements of interaction. Meaning that a conversation develops over time by turn taking and the turn taking can feed off of one another. Now we're sort of back to that third theory in the business of the what's its name? The constitutive or regulative or purposive theory of language. Well, 
last theory, communication planning theory. It sort of sums up where we've been going. We can get through this fairly quickly and still have time for a review. The notion is that people learn, draft, enact plans to achieve goals. Their ability to do so depends upon the, well, let's, let's go back through that. Their ability, the goals that they have in mind, and the complexity of the plans can affect the success of their interactions. One of the arguments that we make is that you can undertake a communication objective with too much of a plan or too little of a plan. Does that sort of make sense intuitively? That I've got either too much of a plan or too little of a plan. Women typically are more complex communication planners. Doesn't surprise any of us that have sort of been tracking the comments that we've made that suggest gender differences. Interpersonal communication, people argue because of women's socialization in American society being different, women approach it, learn it, and use it differently than men do. Typically women have much more complex plans which may include getting into and out of conversations. Because women can often see the implications of if this conversation goes bad, I want to be able to get out of it. Men are often terribly bad about not knowing how to get out of a conversation. Well, that leads them to doing something that can be seen as kind of dumb and dopey, and that's just quit talking. Women are typically more skilled. The guy just sits there and becomes mute, looks like a sphinx, acts like an idiot. Why did you quit talking? Because I don't know that I've got a useful plan at this point to go beyond this. I'm trapped. You're better at this. This is a chess game, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So part of it is our ability, which means that we monitor ourselves to see how good we are. And we may be terribly bad and think we're good. We may be terribly good and think we're bad. Some of this ties into self-image. The goals that we have, what are the goals? To what extent do we recognize that the behavior is goal-driven? And finally, the complexity of the plans. Complexity simply being, if I go in for a job interview, one of the recommendations that I make is that students ought to go out and try to interview as many times as they can be interviewed so that when they eventually get to that one big job that they really want, they are better at it. They're more skilled at it because they've had more practice at it because it can affect the success of our interaction. We can be perceived differently depending upon our skills. Plans are learned and applied through modification. These plans assume because some of them are ritualistic. So ritualistic, particularly at various times, I go into Wendy's, I say I'll have a number one with pickles, mustard, and onions, and their response is, do you want to biggie size that? Now, I've developed a ritualistic biggie size response, which is, I'm already too biggie sized. And then sometimes I say, Dave ought to tell you people not to do this, because in one of these days you're going to get sued for promoting increased consumption of trans-organic fats or whatever that trans thing is. My wife and daughter know and I just go along with their ideas. Okay, assume that some plans are developed. We strategically set out to develop a plan given the logic at hand at the moment. Assumes that some plans are variously challenging. Children are wonderful in that regard, aren't they? They get all tangled up in their plan because the plan gets to be more complicated than their ability. And sometimes when that happens, what do children do? They respond out of frustration, and frustration leads to anger, and they get mad. Or they begin to cry or something because they have a goal, but they don't have the plan that can help them to achieve that. Then when they get to be 30 and the same thing happens, we have the potentiality in some instances of something called domestic violence. There is, for instance, a literature on domestic violence that suggests that one reason that somebody becomes abusive is that fists, in this person's mind, work better than words. There has even been some therapy, which I'm really not sure of, 
that suggests then that one of the ways to deal with these people is to try to make them better communicators. There are other people that say, well, we just ought to lock these people up so they never get out. I don't know what the answer is. But part of the notion of responding in a dysfunctionally violent way is either because that was learned from childhood, and sometimes it is, and or it's just the same sort of frustration that a child experiences when they want Reese's peanut butter cups and mom won't buy them for them. That I cannot use communication to achieve the objective that I have at hand. So the notion then is that all of this gets in some sense relatively complicated. All of this is online. I know that some of you are trying desperately to write all of this down, right? More competent communicators, no plans that are longer and broader in their options. That logic ought to make sense now. They're more competent because they're more competent. What increases their competence? Because they have longer plans with more options, and they're even broader in the array. More competent communicators are comfortable in using plans that are long and broader in options, meaning they're skilled and they're they sense their skill. They are aware of their skill. They're positively oriented toward themselves as a communicator. Complex plans are good because they offer lots of options. But also, a complex plan may strain the ability of the user. Interaction can be hampered by individuals who attempt plans that are too long and complex in option for their ability to handle at that moment, right? Children are a good example. Oh, so that was the end. I guess I can go back. I thought there was one more slide, but you can copy to your heart's content. Well, there we are. Three chapters, persuasion, essentially the question of social influence. How do we acquire attitudes? How do we acquire beliefs? How do we become motivated? How do we make choices that are goal-oriented that help us to achieve what is a positive outcome and avoid what is a negative outcome. That's a very, very simplistic, but nevertheless accurate and synthesizing view of persuasion. Oh, I'll never be able to repeat that. The notion is that persuasion has to do with how we go about figuring out what we like, what we dislike, what we believe, what we don't believe, and then what we want to do and what we don't want to do to produce positive outcomes and avoid negative outcomes. That's a repetition paraphrase, right? Ask me again, I'll tell you a third version of the same thing. Anyway, chapter six, I think, right, would be the next one. That was interpersonal communication. What are the key variables of relationship development? Chapter seven, social cognition. Planning ends, you see, in a way, kind of drawing both of those together. But the planning part takes us back to the beginning of social cognition. Social cognition said that I only know who you are by what you say and do and what is said about you. So planning is, then, it's like a little drama, isn't it? It's like a little drama. I learn all these little roles. This is the role that I'm playing. And I'm trying by the playing of this little role, which may be scripted and partially routinely planned, but I may also have some other plans as well, that I demonstrate that I am a good friend, that I am a worthy spouse, that I am a good employee. Do you see what I'm getting at? I'm a good conversationalist. I can buy products. I can sell products. I can do lots of things in an interpersonal context. I can be seen in a positive sense then, or in a negative sense, which means that we often also have plans that lead to the termination of a relationship as well as the building of a relationship. Communication in varying ways is strategic, it is ritualistic, and sometimes it is innovative, depending upon where we are in life's mysteries. So, with that let me go ahead. I'll be happy to shut the tape off.
Thank you.